In this video, we're going to take a look at exceptions and how we can use exceptions to make our program run more smoothly and fulfill the three components of good Android design, which are Simplify, Enchant, and Amaze. Exceptions tend to be a bit of a bother if you don't know what they are. In our last few videos, we made an implementation class where we reach out and grab some data from a network. And what we'll see, let me to resize for a moment. Okay. And we kind of ignored the exception, to be honest with you. If you take a look in plant DAO impl, you'll see that we have a try block, and then we have a catch block. And we're not really doing anything significant in that catch block. We're just saying print stack trace, which, to be honest, is kind of a cop-out. If you're new to programming, this is the easy way out. This is the easy thing to do, and it seems like a bit of an annoyance. But exceptions are really helpful to us. And let's take an example. The Android design principles are simplify my life, uh, amaze me, and enchant me. We want to think for the user when possible. We don't want to have some kind of button where we have the user choose whether the user is online or offline. We want to be very aware that the user can be offline at certain times just where the user is. So if I have my phone, I'm in a building like on UC's campus in Crosley, a big concrete building, and I'm in the elevator, I'm probably going to be intermittently offline. And we want our app to not crash. If our app crashes regularly, we're going to have some significant quality problems that we need to address. So we want our app to not crash. So what does that mean, don't crash? Well, it means two things. One is handle threads well, to be honest with you, because bad threading can lead to lockups. The other thing is be wise about how we're handling exceptions. So what is an exception? If I go to the course website, which is ucjava.com, I'm going to come right back to this slide. I just want to show you how to get there. I'm going to choose Computer Programming 2, and then from the drop-down, I'm going to choose Exceptions. Well, first, let's look at a broader category of errors. There are three types of errors. There are syntax errors, which, to be honest with you, we catch those very quickly. If you're in the Eclipse development environment, uh, if I were to misspell something, like maybe capitalize all here, it will redline and tell me that I have a syntax error. It means that I've misspelled the name of the all plants variable that I'm using. So that's a syntax error. If we go back to when I started teaching back in 2000, 2001, that school year, you had to actually compile your program as a separate step. Nowadays, every time you save, the program automatically compiles. But back then, you had to actually compile your program as a separate step, and that compilation step would tell you your syntax errors. So one of the things I used to tell students a lot is to compile frequently. Many times a student would spend three hours working on a project and not compile it until the very end, and therefore not see the errors until the very end. Right now we get very quick feedback on our syntax errors because when we save, it compiles. When it compiles, it checks for syntax errors. Another type of error we can have is a runtime error. We really want to avoid this on mobile. This is an important one to avoid because a runtime error will typically crash our program. Inside of runtime errors, we have these things called exceptions. And there are two types of exceptions in the Java programming language. There is a checked exception and an unchecked exception. An unchecked exception is something that we should prevent as programmers, and I will show you uh, some techniques on how to do that in a moment. A checked exception is something that might come up just because of the environment where we are, and we as programmers have to be proactive and think, what would we do in this situation? For example, there's a checked exception that will happen between the try and the match and catch here. And let's see what it is. What I'm doing here is I am requesting a resource that's available on the web. Okay, what could possibly go wrong? Think to yourself, what could possibly go wrong? What if I'm offline? If I'm offline, can it get to this web address? Can it get to this web address if I'm not connected to the network? 
And the answer is no. The answer is no. So if we're going to do a network activity, Java is going to force us to at least think about what we should do if something goes wrong. This is true for a network activity, also for a file activity. What if our disk runs out of space? What do we do? Also, uh, for connecting to a database. What if the database is unavailable? What do we do? So in these checked exceptions, Java wants us to think of an alternative plan. Now this is a bit different from my friends in C Sharp. In C Sharp, they don't, at least last time I taught it, they don't have a concept of checked exceptions. All exceptions are unchecked in C Sharp. In Java, there's this concept of a checked exception, which is if you're going to take part in an activity where there could be something unexpected happen. Well, actually, it's not unexpected. It's very likely that you could not have network access. You need to consider how to handle that. There are basically two approaches. One approach is try to handle it locally. Is there anything you can do right away to fix it? The other approach is if you can't handle it locally, push it back to the method that called you and see what that can do. So that's what we call catching an exception, which is a way to handle it locally. And throwing an exception means giving it back to the method that called you. These are two common ways we can handle exceptions. Okay. So for checked exceptions, we want to think of an exception handling strategy. For unchecked exceptions, we want to try to avoid those. And again, I'll show you those uh, in, in a little bit. Logic errors are a bit difficult. With logic errors, your program runs fine. It just doesn't give you the results that you want. Uh, or maybe it doesn't. the business logic that you want it to run does not run. These are a bit tricky to find because your program could be in production for a long time before you realize that you have a logic error in your program. So logic error just means does it meet the requirements. Let's say, for example, in the plant uh, search by color that I've demonstrated several times, what if instead of when you select a picture, what if it actually returned the next picture instead of the one that you selected? Okay, what if I went to choose a picture from the file system and instead of the picture that I tapped, it actually returns the next picture, the picture after the one that I tapped? It would still give us a color match result, but it would be for the wrong picture. Everything would run fine, the program wouldn't crash, but it'd be giving us bad data. So that's what we will call a logic error. Okay, looking at exceptions, uh, this, is, this uh, describes a little bit about what I talked about before, which is there are two types of exceptions, checked and unchecked. Okay, let me give you an example of an unchecked exception and a checked exception. First, with the checked exception, we are required to put in this try-catch block or our program will not compile. That's how we know an exception is a checked exception. Watch what happens when I comment all of this out. Okay. When I comment all of this out, we get all kinds of red lines. If I look here, it says unhandled exception type exception. We get a red line here. What that means is that by calling the network, uh, it, throws a, it may throw a checked exception and we have to decide what to do. So I'll go ahead and put my try catch block, block back. Okay. Now, I like Android programming, but to be honest with you, uh, sometimes it's a bit tricky to demonstrate a very simple concept. So what I'm going to do is make just a quick and dirty project. We're going to call this, uh, we could, well, let's see, I'll go to Java project. This is a non-Android Java project, just a normal old Java project. And we'll say uh, exceptions demonstration, then that's fine. Just a quick and dirty Java project, and let me see if I can squeeze this up so we can... Okay, I'll choose next. Okay, um, nothing fancy here, so I'll go ahead and choose finish. And I end up with a very simple project. I have a source folder. I'll choose new, class, and I need to give it a package. I'll just call it demo name, we'll say exception runner, uh, again, a quick and dirty, and finish, just a quick Java program. Okay, I start with a blank class, PSVM, oh shoot, doesn't work that way, okay. There was a shortcut, 
There we go, main. Uh, okay, this is a special method, public static void main. That is the method where this program will start, if I just have this program start um, as an individual program. So let's take a look here. If I say string prompt, and then I say Uh, okay, trying for more shortcuts and no luck. Okay, system. Well, let's say uh, J option pane dot show input dial or show message dialog null comma prompt. Okay. Control shift O organize imports. Okay. What I'm trying to do is pop up a message box, and let me put some text to this. Pop up a message box with the text that is in the prompt variable, okay? So you see I've declared a variable of type string named prompt, and now I'm showing a message box with the text that's in that prompt variable. But here's the problem. I've never assigned anything to that prompt variable, so this will not let me compile. The message I get is the local variable prompt may not have been initialized. This won't let me compile because uh, to have, to properly declare a variable, I should also give it a value as well. So we'll say hello, and this should run, and I'll save. And now what I'm gonna do is right click and choose run as Java application and let's see what happens. We should just get a simple message box appear and that should say hello and there we go. So J option pane show message dialog will show us a message box. See it worked fine with the word hello. Now if we don't want to assign anything to it we can assign, assign a null. Okay, But that's not a good idea because that can lead us to a, an exception. That can lead us to what's called a null pointer exception, and that one actually was fine. Uh, that can lead us to a null pointer exception. If I say null, uh, get the length of the length of the string in prompt prompt dot length. Okay, int length equals prompt dot length. So get the number of characters. Okay. Now, in my prompt, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say prompt plus length, okay? I'm going to find out how many characters are in prompt, and then I'm going to call prompt. I'm going to put up a little prompt with the text here and the number of characters in that text. So let me run this, and I bet it's not going to work. Okay, we'll go ahead and save. Okay, what we end up with is we didn't get our message box, and if you take a look down here uh, at the console, we got an error called a null pointer exception. And the reason is this. If you see prompt here, we've assigned null to it, which means this, we've assigned nothing to it. Okay? We've assigned nothing to it. We haven't assigned the string called null to it. If we assigned a string called null, it would be surrounded with quotes like that, and that would be fine. We've assigned nothing to this prompt. So, when we call the, the uh, length, we're calling it on an object that doesn't exist, and it gives us a null pointer exception. That's an example of a check, uh, an unchecked exception. It's something we should prevent from happening. Let's say I change the prompt to say stuff. Now let's watch, and this should run properly. We should get stuff and then five. Yeah, so stuff and then five characters and five, and that's that's what we get here. So you see, we have a null pointer exception if we don't properly initialize a variable to a value if we don't properly initialize a variable to a value. Now let me try something else. Let's say prompt equals j option pane show input dialog enter a number okay so we're gonna have the user enter a number and then what we're going to do is we're going to say convert the number, uh, convert the number as text to a number data type. That probably sounds really confusing, doesn't it? 
Well, the reason is when we prompt a user for something, we have to save it as a string. No matter what the user enters, we have to save it as a string. What we'll do is we want to convert this to an int, because if it's an int data type, we can do math on it. So I'll say int int prompt equals integer dot parse int prompt. Okay. Oh, I misspelled integer. Integer dot parse int prompt. Okay. And now we'll say, we'll print out int prompt plus length. That'll work. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're prompting the user for a number. And then we are going to convert that number. We're going to convert that, uh, that it, we're going to prompt the user for a number. But whatever we get from the user will be a string data type. As a matter of fact, I can do like so. Let me get rid of this. We're not using this line anymore. So I'm prompting the user for a number. But anytime we prompt the user, what we get back is a string. Okay. So what I do is I have to convert this string to a number. And the difference is, once I have it as an int data type, I can perform math on it. As a string, I cannot perform math on it, but as an int, I can. Okay? Um, and then we're going to print that out. So let's go ahead and run this, and let's watch what happened when I give it proper output. Or proper input, rather. Okay, go ahead and save. Okay, when I enter the number 15, all works well. Okay, something funny happened there. You see, I entered the number 15. It actually added together the number 15 and the number of characters in 15, which was 2, and it gave us the number 17. But you see, it actually ran It ran fine when I did that. If I run it again, uh, I can give it the number uh, 1, and it gives me back a 2 because it's adding both the number 1 and the number of characters in the number 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2. Okay, that works great. Now watch what happens. Let's say that I run this application, and instead of putting in a number, I put in some text. Okay, what's going to happen? Boom. We're going to get another exception, and the exception means our program has died. And what this is is a number format exception. We get this number format exception because... Uh, because we've we've not entered a valid number. Okay, that's what gives us a number format exception. So what we can do is we can wrap this with a try catch block to ensure that the user enters proper data. Okay, try. And all the dangerous stuff we put into this try catch block. Okay catch exception e okay now i'll say j option pane show message dialog null comma you did not enter a proper number and we'll just leave it at that and save so see what i'm doing now joe i misspelled j option pane what I'm doing now, since I've wrapped this in a try-catch block, and let me even this out a little bit. Since I've wrapped this in a try-catch block, what I'm doing now is I'm saying, try to convert the user's input to a number. But if the user did not enter a number, then tell the user you did not enter a number, and we can even say in proper format. Something like that. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to convert the user's input to a number. If it works... This catch block will never fire, and the user will never see this. The catch block is only going to happen if the user enters an invalid number. So let's try this again. I'm going to save, and let's watch a couple scenarios. Ooh, it's warning me something here. Int prompt. Okay. Uh, let me say... It's mad at me because I'm declaring this int prompt within the try block. Okay, let me declare this outside. One second, I need to make a little adjustment. Int prompt equals zero. Well, let's see if we can do it like that. Okay, we'll do it like that. So we just have to declare the variable outside. Now, is it still mad at me? May not have been initialized. Int int prompt equals zero. 
Okay, and there we go, and save. Uh, let's run and watch what's going to happen now. Okay, run as Java application. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to start by entering a valid number like 19. And we should have the same behavior that we had before. It takes 19, adds that to the number of characters in 19, which is 2, gives us back the number 21, and it smiles. Everything ran well. Now let me try again. Okay, this time I'm going to enter garbage data. Okay, I enter garbage data. It gives me the message, and notice this message only appears if I enter garbage data. But then what's a bit misleading is it gives me this 10 number as a message. And what's funny is why are we giving back output if the user entered invalid data? Here's something we might want to do. If an exception occurs, it will hit the catch block, but it will skip all of the lines between the point where the exception occurred and the catch block itself. So, if there's any logic that we want to have happen only if no exception was thrown, what we want to do is we want to move it like this. We want to move it between the line where the exception could be thrown and the catch block. Anything that falls between those two lines will only execute if no exception was thrown. Okay, so where we put things is important. If an exception could be thrown here, then the lines between that line and the catch block will only execute if no exception was thrown. So these are safe lines here. These are lines that will only execute if the user entered valid data. If the user didn't enter valid data, it's going to skip right to the catch block. So what we're going to see now, after I save, is I'm going to go back and run this program again. Okay. And I'm going to start by entering valid data, and we're only going to see the prompt that gives us uh, a little bit of feedback, which would be 15 plus 2 is 17. There we go. Now, let me enter it with invalid data. Okay. And what we're going to see now is instead of getting both the prompt that tells us we had invalid data and then the little confirmation prompt that gives us the length of the string, we're only going to see the prompt that tells us we had invalid data. And there we go. So notice the difference there. Notice the difference. These lines only execute if this line executes without error. On the other hand, if this line 15 does have an error, it skips right down to the catch block. So that's a quick demonstration of try-catch uh, and how it can be used in our program. In our next video, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how we can use try-catch to give the user a seamless online-offline experience. Pretty neat stuff. So try-catch block tends to really confuse people in their first year of programming, but if you have a very good and practical application of where you would use try-catch uh, and how you can use that to simplify the user's life, all of a sudden it makes a whole lot more sense. And that's what we're going to cover in our next video. Thank you.